I've been fascinated by the Maharaja of Endor for a really long time. It was mostly just a side interest, and for years I snuck in a teeny little extra focus on the Maharaja of Endor in my Art Deco week in History of Industrial Design for a bunch of reasons. One, I generally have a number of Indian students, and it's nice to have an opportunity to help people see design history that we're talking about alive in their own native culture. Also, I don't know a lot about cars, and I'm expected to include them in the class, and this is a fun way to do it because there's some beautiful cars involved, but mostly because teaching is more fun when you can sneak things you're interested into it uh, under the guise of education. And so over the years, I've just collected the little scraps of information that I could. Then in 2019, the Decorative Art Museum in Paris had an entire exhibition about the Maharaja of Endor, and suddenly there's lots more information available. And you know when you're interested in something that's hard to find information about, it becomes precious to you. And then when the world gets more information, like when the internet was invented, part of you is thrilled that the world gets better access and you can find better information, but then part of you is annoyed that your special private interest is now everywhere. So I'm thrilled that there's so much more information about the Maharaja available now, but I didn't get to see the exhibition and I haven't even seen the published catalog. So it's possible that all of my information scraped together over the years is now sort of instantly obsolete. I have a couple of disclaimers, of course. I need to point out I am a total outsider to this conversation. I don't have any way of knowing how badly I'm pronouncing things. Indian culture has such a gorgeous abundance of names linguistically. And I am choosing the parts that I can grasp. I may be making some bad choices. I'm certain I'm not pronouncing things especially well. Uh, unfortunately, with my students scattered to the wind and us communicating digitally, I don't even have anyone to ask. So bear with me. There is a lot of Art Deco in evidence in India. As with Miami, for example, there were a lot of new building projects because there was new land uh, that became available. Bombay's Back Bay Reclamation Project from 1929 to 1940 added 440 acres of land, all in the Art Deco period, which could be developed in the Art Deco style. So Marine Drive is a great example of that. Also, India embraced movies, the new technology of the movie house, which I talked about in the Art Deco lecture, in a really big way. And many of those Art Deco movie palaces are still there in India for people to see and enjoy. But for me, the most entrancing presence of Art Deco in India is the Maharaja of Endor. Yashwantra Holkar II was the Maharaja of Endor in the period we're going to look at. His regency began in 1926 when his father abdicated and he ascended to the title in 1930, and he was only 22 years old at the time. His father's abdication was prompted by a scandal involving the abduction of his mistress and an accidental murder in the process. But it can also be seen as something imposed by the British as part of the colonial machinery that worked to take over regional leadership and actual governance of India. The British established locally elected British ministers and British agents to manage government throughout India, leaving the former rulers in place but stripping of them of most of their power. So ab there are a lot of abdications in this period because the British were interested in getting the more traditional idea about leadership out and the next generation in because they would be a little bit more pliable. Of the many people alive in this era, the Maharaja of Endor is one of my favorites for his unique blending of cultures, of sensibilities, and how well he represents the era's position between the old ways of doing things and new opportunities that the modern world was beginning to offer. Both of these aspects of who he was are perfectly captured in these twin portraits by Boutet de Montvel. On the left, the Maharaja is in traditional Darbar dress, and on the right in, I guess, traditional Parisian evening togs. This is how my interest in the Maharaja started. I loved de Montvel's portraits, and I saw these first and thought I've got to know more about this person. The Maharaja was married in 1924. And yes, if you do the math, you'll see that both of them were extremely young. And his bride, Senyogita Devi, accompanied him in this exploration of Eastern and Western combinations. De Montfel also created dual portraits of her, which are equally beautiful and equally rewarding when you start to examine all of the subtle details. In the portrait on the right, 
the Maharani is wearing a dress by Madeleine Vionnet for any fashion buffs out there. In addition to this couture dress, she's wearing a necklace created by Maubussin with a new setting of the Endora pearls created in 1931, and for this they added a huge Honkin emerald. Interestingly, the Maharaja is also wearing the Endora pearls in his portrait in the original Chaumet setting purchased by his father in Paris, and I don't know how that happened. This brief talk will be full of so many conflicting dates, gauzy narratives, confusing details. It's very hard to piece some of this together, and I think some of that is quite intentional. So it's possible that a necklace that existed before 1931 and a necklace created in 1931 both exist in simultaneous portraits from 1934 because the diamonds were demountable and could be moved from one setting to the other, or because the painter was seizing an opportunity to talk about this transfer from old-fashioned to new-fashioned ways. The Endora pear-shaped diamonds are almost 47 carats each. They're huge. Even though the Maharani died tragically young at just 23 years old, they still enjoyed a relatively long 12-year marriage and were a very happy couple. The diamonds have a funny trajectory, which we'll revisit later. They were sold to Harry Winston in 1946, and I'm including this picture of them in the Harry Winston setting, worn by Shirley Temple in 1951, just because it's so weird to see what can happen to jewels as they're reset and transcend the sort of boundaries of style and taste and time and personality. In 1987, Christie sold the diamonds, now reset as earrings, for $2.7 million. De Montfel was brilliant. He was able to capture a likeness with an accuracy that was astounding, but also add layers of attitude and personality, which is important in portrait painting, and in addition, add another layer that communicated something of the spirit of the time. That's the sign of a great portrait artist, transcending the opportunities of representing a person to also create an artistic statement. Hooker was educated in England at Chime and Charterhouse, and that's another part of the colonial effort. Take people from the colonies, a certain kind of person at any rate, bring them to England and educate them to be good British citizens and then send them back as a way to sort of seed British ideas in non-British territories. After his accession, he spent some time at school in India and then returned to England to study at Christchurch College, Oxford. And the Maharani was with him through much of this. They traveled on holidays throughout the British Isles, through Europe, in cars that we're going to look at later. There are many portraits of the couple by Man Ray from 1927 and 1929, and in his 1965 autobiography called Self-Portrait, Man Ray wrote, The Maharani was an exquisite girl in her teens. She wore French clothes and a huge emerald ring. The Maharaja had bought it for her that morning while taking a walk. The next day, I was asked to bring my camera to their suite to make a series of photographs that would be a record of their honeymoon. First, I had to play some jazz, to which the subjects danced, and then they sat down holding hands. I made a few exposures, after which I suggested that they pose separately for individual portraits. In this photo, the Maharaja is wearing the Endora Sapphire. It's a 23-carat 18th century stone that was mounted by Cartier in the 1920s in this very, very reduced, simple, chain through a drilled hole. In 2019, this necklace sold for $206,000. And it's really unlike me to throw numbers at you like this. I don't like attaching contemporary value to objects from history. One, I think it's crass. It devalues the objects. Two, I don't think it matters. It doesn't matter what they're worth today. What was happening in the world that created them is the story. But in this case, I think their value today is a part of the story. The extreme wealth involved allowed all of this to happen. At the same time, the choices the Maharaja made in how to spend his money really show his interests in design, and the value of those objects today helps us understand the strength of those choices. He invested in some radical things in his day that other people wouldn't have spent money on, and those turn out to be very smart decisions historically. In 1937, it was reported that he was worth an estimated $20 million. That's just under $400 million today. But in the 1961 New York Times obituary, it said he was worth $70 million, which is about $600,000 today. So who cares? 
there was money involved, right? In addition to Man Ray, the couple befriended many artists throughout Europe, Brancusi, Jacques Doucet, Ruhlman, and they functioned as a sort of perfect embodiment of the Jazz Age style and many of the dualities of the time. They were like a living cultural mashup. In an address to the youth of India that he gave in 1937 when he became ruler, he said, times are changing fast in India. Besides the orthodox minded who are content with the state of affairs which has existed for centuries and who want no change, there are others who are hot for immediate and radical changes, mostly inspired from abroad and for which this country is not prepared, or shall I say, changes which would throw India into a turmoil of barren strifes and conflicts leading nowhere. Between these two extremes, we want progress and improvement, and the first condition for this is peace. So it's by combining, mixing together, uh, that India could find a way forward in his vision for it. And I think that's really clear in the decisions he made about how he would live. He was very forward-looking. While attending Oxford at just 19 years old, he lived with a French tutor whose daughter was married to Eckhart Muthesius, son of the famous German architect Hermann Muthesius. And if you're in my history of industrial design class, I'm hoping that name sounds familiar to you because you might have encountered some of his writing recently in your homework. Their friendship developed into a professional partnership that lasted through many projects over quite a bit of time. He hired Muthesius to design a new palace for him in India. And it's just, I want to point out that Muthesius was 25 at the time, Holkar was 22, and Senor Gita was just 17 in 1930. So this is a pretty remarkable accomplishment for what I consider to be children. And it's a triumph of modernism, largely responsible for introducing modernism and European architecture to India. One of the fascinating side notes about this palace is that in publicity, and in photographs, it has flat roofs and long horizontal canopies. In actuality, that wouldn't really work very well in monsoon season, and the palace has peaked roofs that were painted out. They were airbrushed out in the photographs for publicity purposes. So the rest of the world thought the building looked very different than it actually did. In 1934, Fortune magazine wrote about the building and called it a giant fridge placed in the middle of traditional houses. Manik Bagh means jewel gardens, and I think that's sort of a funny name for a place that is so completely focused on its interiors. All of the interiors of Manik Bagh were completely modern, all modern, all the time. There is not a sign of anything traditional here. And importantly, there's not a sign of anything Indian here. And importantly, there's not a sign of anything British here. It's mostly German and French contemporary design, and that was very intentional. That was pointing out that the long traditions in India and the more recent colonial history from the British were things that needed to be reconsidered. Another view from the same room shows the de Montvel portrait of the Maharaja in Parisian clothing, right there for all the visitors to see right when they came in. And that was also a very intentional statement. Muthesius designed most of the furnishings, but his work was augmented by imported furniture by a who's who of design in the 1930s, the Luckharts, Marcel Breuer, Le Corbusier, Charlotte Perriand, Eileen Gray, Emile Jacques Ruhlman, Louis Sognon, Charlotte A. Lee, Ivan de Silva Bruns for the carpets, Jean Puyforcat for the silver. Everybody you want from 1930 had something in this house. It was reported that he spent $4 million on furniture for the palace. I don't have a way to substantiate that, but it's a number that's thrown around a bunch. And the palace was photographed by Muthesius and also featured extensively in the press. There are a lot of photos from the era. I believe the ones I'm showing you are from 1933 from a photo shoot that Muthesius did, but I might be wrong about some of those. I like seeing the pictures all together and trying to puzzle out how all the rooms were connected. There was modernism everywhere. This is a photograph of the children's room from 1930. There wasn't a child until 1933. It is possible that this picture is from 1933 and a room was redone. It's possible that the room was built in anticipation of the arrival of children. The record says that the furniture is custom made by Marcel Breuer in children's size and the tables by Lily Reich. I went through the Tonnet catalogs from the time 
And the first children's chair that enters the catalogs was 1932 by Marcel Breuer. And I love the name. It's a small version of the B-34. So it's called the B-34 and a half. And on the right, I've shown you the Manik Bag children's chair so you can compare them. They're not the same construction. And below is the B-55 chair from 1933, which tips towards a similar construction method, but is still a little bit different. So it is entirely possible that these were custom-made chairs because they don't appear anywhere else in the production output of Marcel Breuer's Tonnet Furniture. It's also possible that they're from 1930 and started the ball rolling in both the children's furniture and that particular design. And it's also possible that they're from 1933 and are just a smaller version of what was already happening. The palace had tinted and clear windows combined in a way that would help regulate light, and it was the first air conditioning system installed in India. I've been puzzling together the, the rooms with different pictures, and one of the tools to do that are the rugs. The palace was full of remarkable rugs. Several of them were purchased from the workshop of Ivan de Silva Bruns, which was called Manufacture de Savigny. He's an interesting fellow. He was a painter who decided he was interested in carpets and taught himself how to think about carpet construction by unraveling existing oriental carpets. This particular one was sold at Phillips in 2016 for $500,000. All of the black and white photos from the 30s show the palace in its ultimate starkness. It's like a triumph of reduced surfaces and quiet luxury. But the existing parts of this equation, rugs and furniture, suggest that it was actually a riot of colors and chrome. I don't know who designed the bed. This is an image from 1980 from the Sotheby's auction catalog, and I don't have the caption for it. And the bed was in the exhibition in Paris, but I haven't found a picture that shows the label. The palace looks much less austere when photographed in color. And Robert Ducharme did so in 1970 for an article about the palace in Connaissance des Arts magazine. This image shows the Maharaja's bedroom, and in the background you can see the I totally iconic chaise longue created by Le Corbusier, Charlotte Perriand, and Pierre Jeanneret. This example is covered in leather, and it ends up being the example that most people think about when they consider this chaise longue. It's completely iconic as a design, but it's also iconic as a design paired with leopard. And that's interesting because this is actually the only one. This was the prototype sold to Muthesius by Le Corbusier in 1930, sent to India with its original black leather, where it was reupholstered with leopard. Today, Tonnet makes this chair in black leather, brown leather, a bunch of colors, but also with uh, natural cowhide. And I think that's an effort to bring the flavor of this model back to life in a contemporary version. Tonnet did not begin producing the chaise until 1930, so after this version had made it to India and did so in black leather, it was never very popular. They produced only 170 in the first five years of production. The music room featured an entire suite of one of the most expensive and, for me, one of the most excellent chairs of the era. I can count 18 of them in this photograph, so I'm assuming that it was a suite of 24, which seems more likely. The Luckard chair is the apex of the investigation of cantilevered tubular steel seating. It was not made in huge quantities. Uh, it's a very difficult chair to make. It's completely handmade. It, it requires a number of different techniques for bending to get the different kinds of curves and different directions of curve. And as a result, it was quite expensive. I believe this was the largest suite of them sold. This suite is now dispersed. And interestingly, chairs from the suite serve as examples of this design in a number of institutions. The Victorian Albert Museum acquired one in 1984. The Met in New York acquired one in 2003. The MoMA's version from 1980 may also have come from this set. In 2006, another chair from this suite sold for $30,000. The chairs are also featured in this 1970 photograph, which gives us a great sense of the color in this office. But this is not the original furniture combination. These chairs were in the ballroom, and a set of chairs made by Ruhlman that matched the desk were originally in the office. There's a really lovely story about how this desk and the chairs arrived at the palace. 
Ruman was entranced by the idea of the Maharaja. He had never met him, he heard about him. And he used the idea of the Maharaja as inspiration for his 1929 Salon des Artistes Decorateurs exhibition. And then the Maharaja and Muthesius saw the exhibition and acquired the suite for the palace. The picture on the left is the office as installed at the palace. The pictures on the right are not that same desk. These are later versions that Ruhlman made. The one on top was acquired by André Tardieu, the Prime Minister of France in 1929, and was auctioned at Christie's in 2011 for over $3 million. Is that because of its association to Tardieu, because of that it's a Ruhlman desk, because it matches the one the Maharaja had? I would say the answer is yes to all of those. And the color picture on the bottom is a third version that was created. But the Maharaja had the original one, and it was made in Macassar Ebony, which is a beautiful uh, figured wood grain, very dark color. Later models were made in lesser woods and stained dark. And this is the actual salon installation where you can see the different components of the, the furniture suite. There are other pictures I would like to have shown you, but I'm shortening this um, for your own sanity that show the map on the back wall and help illustrate how accurately this installation transferred to the Maharaja's office. The palace also contained a rare example of Eileen Gray's transat chair. There are only records for the production of 12 of this design, and only nine survive today, most of them in private collections. This particular chair from the Maharaja's bedroom was auctioned by Phillips Auction House in 2014 for $1.5 million. Puyforcat designed custom monograms for the Maharaja and Maharani, and they were applied to the 700-piece silver service they created for the palace. This is the Monaco pattern, which was designed in 1925, but the 1935 set for the Maharaja has the addition of ebony at the bottom. It's difficult to see in these photographs, but there's like a cylinder of ebony that has been applied over the silver at the bottom of every piece. And it must have been quite a remarkable contrast, the silver and the dark wood. That same monogram was used on other things. This is a key for a sideboard designed by Muthesius for the dining room and embossed stationery. And the image on the bottom right is a close-up of a radiator grill. The Maharaja had his emblem attached to many of his cars. Holkar struck up a friendship with Brancusi, which led to the acquisition of a number of sculptures. There are a couple of wooden statues at the MoMA from his collection, but I'm just showing you the three he purchased in 1933, black and white marble and polished bronze versions of Brancusi's Birds in Space. Brancusi was asked to plan a temple for meditation in 1933, and that shifted with the death of the Maharani into a memorial to her in 1937, and it was conceived as a windowless egg-shaped chamber with a ceiling opening that let light into an interior reflecting pool with frescoes of birds and the three birds in space sculptures. And this was accessed through underground entrances. So it was a very private space for meditation. It was never built. Brancusi went to India in 1937 to oversee construction of the temple, but war prevented the whole project from happening. The black and white marble birds in space are now at the National Gallery of Australia, purchased from the family in 1973, and the bronze sculpture is at the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, also purchased from the family in 1972. With the royal family spending so much time out of the country and in other residences, the palace was not much lived in. It passed to the Maharaja's children on his death in 1961. And in 1976, royal privileges were revoked by the state, and the Holkar family sold Manikbag to the Indian government. Most of the furniture then went to an auction that Sotheby's organized in Monte Carlo in 1980. There's a long auction house record of the objects originally created for this palace, including the Maharaja's chrome-plated aluminum bed. This was designed by French designers Louis Sognon and Charlotte A. Lee and it sold for $200,000 in 2003. There's a whole parade of survivors. I could almost go on forever. I have many slides I removed for sanity's sake, uh, but I just want to show you a couple more. This is a remarkable custom bar designed by Muthesius for the palace. I think it was then removed and used in other residences, and it was offered by Sotheby's in 2011. 
In addition to furniture that Mathesius designed for the palace being sold at auction houses, there's a more recent trend of actual fixtures from the palace appearing for auction. And it's unclear whether those removals happened a long time ago or are happening more recently. But the result is that Muthesius is really gaining momentum as an important voice in European design and modernism. The wall light on the top sold for $62,000 in 2015. The floor lamps on the right sold in 2009 for $2.7 million. So for an architect who was largely forgotten because World War II intervened in his most active years, his reputation is really starting to be reconsidered today. The palace has sort of tragically fallen on pretty hard times. Menachbog is now the office of the Central Excise Commissioner, and this is what the Maharani's bedroom looked like in 2007. Here's the Maharaja's bedroom. So although there is a tubular steel chair that might be a broyer chair, there's no more transat chair, there's no more leopard covered chaise long, just filing cabinets. Muthesius designed other things for his friend and patron. This is a model of the planned summer house that was not constructed. These are four joinable caravans. They back up near each other. The back doors fold down and have a hydraulic support system to level them and create a tented dining room with furniture by Practical Equipment Limited, Pell, from England. The caravans also included a bathroom, a bedroom, a study, and food preparation areas. There were two airplanes with Methusius interiors. And in 1936, Gloucester Railway Carriage and Wagon Company created a custom 54-ton stagecoach with Methusius designed interiors. This was air conditioned by using air over ice, which was a common earlier form of air conditioning. It had an internal telephone system, and at the time it was the largest rail carriage ever constructed in Britain. I tried to find pictures of this, and the only thing I could find was this ad from 1950, which is pretty fascinating, because why was a rail carriage construction company using a train from 1936 to promote itself in 1950? And I can imagine there are two good reasons. One is that the war intervened and really disrupted every aspect of everything having to do with manufacturing and transportation. And then after the war, this was the handiest thing to use to start up the promotional machine. But I think the more true reason is that Muthesius' design was so forward-thinking that even as late as 1950, it still looked contemporary and modern. How they still had it to take pictures of is a story I don't know. By the way, if anyone has good information, share it. It would just be great to fill in some of the blanks in this story. Whole volumes could be written on the jewelry involved in the narrative, and there have been a number of lovely books about the larger story of the jewelry of the Maharajas collectively. We already looked at the pear-shaped diamonds at the beginning. Holkar also owned the Dudley necklace, purchased by his grandfather from the British Earl of Dudley, and I have great pictures of the Maharaja wearing the necklace, but I have less great pictures of the necklace itself. The only color image I could find is from Harry Winston's promotional efforts for his Court of Jewels exhibition. A necklace with 374 diamonds and 15 emeralds is also part of this chapter. It now lives at the Smithsonian Museum, which acquired it in 2008. And they say about the central 45 carat 17th century emerald, Due to its rich color and exceptional clarity, it is one of the world's finest emeralds. There's a whole fascinating scandal about these two necklaces and the pear-shaped diamonds. They were sold in 1946 to American jeweler Harry Winston, and the sale is shrouded in layers of mystery, including the fact that they were not owned by the Maharaja to sell in the first place. They were still owned by his father, who left them behind when he abdicated the throne way back in 1926, and only discovered they were gone when he saw them appear in the news. Also, the sale was arranged through intermediaries, so there's no clear path back to the Maharaja for their export from the country. And this makes a certain amount of sense, because at the time, with India approaching independence, with the different states unifying to make a new nation, there was some hesitancy in the royal families to consider what would happen to their possessions. Would they be taken over by the state? Would they be given to museums? In this case, the whole question was avoided because they disappeared uh, and were sold in advance of that conversation. So as I said, there are layers of intrigue and mystery, and there's some great stories involved, I'm sure. 
I want to focus on what happened to the jewels when they came to America. Harry Winston, the American jeweler, purchased them in 1946. He renamed this necklace the Spanish Inquisition. It has nothing to do with the Spanish Inquisition. He just felt that would make the necklace more exotic. He also loaned it to Catherine Hepburn to wear to the 1947 Academy Awards. And this starts the trend that still continues today of jewelry houses lending important pieces to be worn on red carpet events. The image on the bottom was used to promote the exhibition that toured for four years called Court of Jewels, and it shows a model wearing both necklaces, both pearls, a number of other important pieces of jewelry, and improbably the Hope Diamond smacked on her forehead. I find this image to be, I mean, there's so many adjectives I could use, grossly insulting uh, to the really glorious tradition of wearing jewels as a public statement of importance. When you consider how well these particular jewels had been worn by generations in the past, so here are four generations of the Holkar family wearing these jewels, I think this model has no reason to look quite as smug as she seems to. Originally, this whole talk was just an excuse to look at some cool cars, and I'd put the slides up on the screen and have little more to say than just, here's some cool cars. So let's visit that chapter, because the Maharaja had some amazing daily rides, reportedly over 60 of them. His mother drove. She was one of the first women in India to do so. And here is the young future Maharaja in the back seat with his sister, with his mother at the wheel. One of his first cars was the 1930 Delage D8. It's important to point out that at this point, this sort of car, these high-end luxury cars, were sold as bare chassis. So Delage made the functioning car, and then it was sent to a bespoke coach builder to have the body built in this case by the French coach builder Figoni. These are the Maharaja's color signatures, the ochre and the black. Many of his cars were painted these colors. And this car has a beautiful crystal lalique hood ornament of victory, victoire. This Bentley was originally cream colored. It's now in, in shades of green, but it was one of only two of this model Bentley produced. The coachwork is by the British coach builder Gurney Nutting, who also made cars for the British royal family. This is one of the few Bentleys that remained in India. The cars of the Indian Maharajas were scattered all over. There are remarkable narratives involving the rediscovery of many of these cars and the, the rehabilitation of them. There's a great book by Gautam Sen, a sort of a collection of, of as, as many of them as I've ever seen in one place. And many of these cars were abandoned as the world they so beautifully represented disappeared. They were also abandoned because they were very, very expensive to maintain. So many of them were rediscovered in sheds and backyards decades later. Many have been restored at tremendous expense and effort, and all are now exceptionally valuable. The Maharaja was one of very few people who was able to buy a Mercedes 540K. There were only around 30 of these built, and he paid 28,000 Reichsmark for this, but I don't know exactly what that means. It's very hard to convert dead currencies into contemporary value. I think it's about a million dollars which means that would be for the chassis and the carriage work. If you watched my airship and dirigible lecture, and if you are a careful observer, and if you have a good visual memory, you will recognize this car because you saw it in this image, which is an advertisement for a Daimler-Benz diesel engine. They're showing the Hindenburg, which was powered by Daimler-Benz engines, and they're showing this Mercedes 540K to promote the idea of the power of their engines. I just want to pause for a second and say, especially to my students if they're watching this, that when you look at images on the internet, they are almost always wrong in some aspect. If you reverse Google image search this image, it comes up as the Baroness Giselle de Josephine von Krieger in front of her Mercedes 540K. And it isn't. It's an ad for Mercedes. But that misattribution on Pinterest got me curious about who this Baroness of Giselle de Josephine von Krieger was. And I'm not telling you today because this is too good a story. It's going to have to wait for something else. She was amazing. But her 540K ended up getting exported to Connecticut and being abandoned in a barn where it turned up. And it sold in 2012 for just under $12 million. The Maharaja bought another 540K in 1937, the next year's model. 
This car ended up with very low mileage. He gave it away pretty quickly as a gift to someone who either wasn't interested or couldn't afford to maintain it, and it was mostly abandoned until the 1970s. It was sold in 2010 for $2 million. The Hispano Suiza originally cost, in 1936, $130,000. That's over $2 million in today's money. And that was, again, just for the chassis. And then Gurney Nutting coachwork was added on top of that. Only 120 of this chassis were made, and only four with this long body survived. Interestingly, the Maharaja had the exact same body constructed by Gurney Nuttig for a Rolls-Royce Phantom III. I couldn't find an image of that. It, I believe, is in California today. I could not find you a, a picture. But I love the idea that the cars would look the same on the outside but have completely different things going on inside. To show you how amazing it is that these cars have survived, this is the Hispano Suiza as it appeared in the 1990s, still in India. There are now laws in effect to prevent these cars from leaving India, because many of them did, uh, and they are considered a national treasure, understandably and rightly. Uh, this car seems to have left the country under some pretty suspicious circumstances, probably in pieces, uh, described as parts, and then reassembled later. The 1938 Alfa Romeo, with carriage work by Carrozzeria Touring from Milan, was the fastest production car in the world at the time it was made. Only 32 of them were made, and this is one of only six made in this configuration, and the Maharaja originally bought two of these, one for him and one for her. In 2016, a similar model sold for just under $20 million. And this car was owned for a while by Ralph Lauren. It was part of his car collection. At the time, it was red. It was sold in 2004 to a new owner who restored it to the two colors in 2005, where it won Best in Class Award at Concourse d'Elegance. It has since sold again and I believe is now all black. So it's very interesting when you find pictures over a long period of time of these classic automobiles. It's oftentimes the same car with different owners and different ideas about color. The 1935 Duesenberg also has a body by Gurney Nutting, and at the time it was the most expensive car available. It was made in London, and it was supposed to be delivered to India, but it was sent instead to the Maharaja's house in Santa Ana, California, because the Japanese invasion of China got people worried about political instability in India. So the car was rerouted to a, a more stable place. And the Lagonda on the bottom is one of only 12 that were made. This one also has a gurney nutting carriage. This car went 100 miles an hour. It's really easy to forget because these cars are so beautiful and clearly so enormous and heavy that they also were fast. I paired these two because they're the only pictures I could find that clearly show the running lights. The Maharaja had two colors of running light on his car, a red and a blue. Here's a close-up to help you see the forward-facing and rear-facing running lights. This was to help people know who was in the car, to help his subjects know how they should salute the car. So if the Maharani was in the car, the blue light was on. If the Maharaja was in the car, the red light was on. If both lights were on, they were both in the car. And most importantly, if no lights were on, you didn't have to bother saluting. Save your energy. To tidy up the story, because I know you want to know the ending, Princess Usha was born in 1933 in Paris, and the Maharani tragically died very soon thereafter, in 1937, of an unspecified hospital accident in Paris. That's a weird turn of phrase that is used in a couple of sources. One says it was complications from an appendicitis, but the language is very weird, and I think it's just another example of sort of a, a, a veil of mystery that every good story should have. The Maharaja remarried Marguerite Brennan Lawler in 1938. They met when she was a nurse at the hospital in Los Angeles where the Maharaja and his family were recovering from a severe cold. She ended up becoming the nurse and governess for Usha and traveled back to India with the family. The Maharani died in 1937 and they were married the next year in 1938. They built a new house in Santa Ana, California and the Santa Ana newspaper at the time in 1938 described it as a fortress with thick walls, iron grilled windows, a burglar alarm, and high walls. There are a couple of reasons for this. The kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh's baby in 1932 had created a sort of national conversation about the safety of prominent children. And Princess Usha certainly was a prominent child at the time. So the house was designed to protect her. Burglar alarm systems were a relatively new innovation. 
that was a response to the Lindbergh kidnapping. But also in 1938, the effects of World War II in Europe were very present in people's minds. And so living in California in a solid house probably seemed like a safe option. The marriage lasted through 1942, and then the Maharaja married Euphramia Watt Crane, who went by Faye, in 1943 in Reno. They had each gone there to get divorces, and the divorces were granted on the same day they were married. There's so much that has happened in the story already, it's easy to forget how young the Maharaja still was. He was just 35. The newspaper said 33, but the math isn't quite right on that. I don't know why. And then the couple had a son named Richard, born in 1944. Both children are still alive and attended the opening of the exhibition in Paris. The Maharaja died at the age of 53 in December of 1961 in a hospital in Bombay. And I hope you agree this was a remarkable life and provides a really excellent glimpse into another flavor of the Art Deco era and also, a, for me, a really valuable opportunity to look at design history when it wasn't history, when it was new and happening. And I hope also attaches an understanding of value to those objects. Most of the objects we look at from this period, we forget were really high-end things for rich people. So seeing them in their context and learning more about the kind of person who embraced them and consumed them might help you better understand where they fit. Yeah, that's good enough. Well, there's so much more to talk about. There's the new palace. How did the Maharaja's efforts in India lead to other Art Deco efforts? Oh, we should look at that. Why can't I figure out what this car is? No one I know can tell me. Look at this cool cat. There he is hanging out in Reno. So many more pictures. Oh well. I'm trying to get the glare of one of these lights off of my glass. What if I do that? No, it's still bad. It's just bad. I just can't worry about it. I go this way. No? This way? It should. It should change. It's just really bad. That's all there is to it. Okay.